Hello, how are you doing? <clears throat> Hi, Sam, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Professor? Good. Were you able to run the program? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, I think I was suspecting it was just the day's um, string definition and that worked out. So it took me like five minutes to fix it. <laughs> Okay. Well, we're going to wait a little bit for everybody to join for a few minutes. While we're doing that, check out your assignment and your notes for today. <clears throat> okay, so I think some of you are here now. Go ahead and check out your unit 11 notes and assignment. We'll go over those shortly. Welcome back. Hello, how are you doing? We'll start in a minute, so check out your notes and your assignments, okay? I posted a couple announcements. Um, if we are running uh, credit and non-credit courses, so that if you want to learn um, Internet of Things or do some programming in C and Python in Arduino and Raspberry Pi. I have a certificate. I will be teaching the course um, when I come back from Atlanta, which is going to be in July. I'm also teaching online for the online classes, but we also have CTE Day um, in the announcement. So I'm doing a demo for cybersecurity on the 20th. And there are two sessions for that. So there will be some live hands-on using some of the tools. And so you can take a look at the flyer and if you want to join, you can sign up, it's Friday. And there are other sessions that are related to CTE programs and CIS is part of CTE. So you can take a look at that. And then if you want to do non-credit, non-credit classes are free and you can get a free certificate and they're short and sweet. So um, I am teaching Arduino Raspberry Pi and I'm using a third board called Coral Development Board. These courses are gonna be held at the Makerspace at Moreno Valley College. And non-credit courses are free. So, you know, if you want to learn some cool stuff this summer. Um, so once you receive the certificate, you can request for um, like a non-credit transcript that shows that you earned a certificate. I think non-credit classes can work toward financial aid as far as the hours from what I've heard 
um, but it is 8.33 ABC. You can find that on the summer schedule. And in the course, you will learn to program Arduino with sensors. Um, and I use all type of sensors from light sensor to servo motor to different things. So we can make really cool stuff um, using circuits and microcontroller and then also embedded system, which is Raspberry Pi. And you will be introduced to how to use uh, embedded Linux in embedded systems. And then also Coral Development Board, which is made by Google. Um, and so you can design your own Internet of Things and program it. So you can make things. And I just acquired Azure uh, IoT Hub. So you can program it and then make it talk to the cloud. So um, like, for example, you can do weather stations. You can do all kinds of different things um, that are smart. And, and that way you can think of how you can make your own or design your own system. Okay, so check that out. If you're interested, you can sign up for the courses. And then I'm doing some credit courses for programming this summer. And I know the fall schedule is up as well. Okay, so let me turn on the live transcript and we'll get started. Any question before we start? All right. So we are going to go through Unit 11 this week. Um, we are going to address the notes and the questions in this particular lecture session. Um, and we have one more lab. And in this week, we are going to do a lab with random number generator in LC3. And in this lab, you are going to learn how to write stack. Um, if I have time today, I'm going to come back to last week's lab, um, not to address the same code, but I do have another program um, that we can look at and see if it is better and it does run and it, it shows the same thing so I can look we can look over the code if we have time today or on Thursday okay so in case you have questions about the lab or if it doesn't work out you can also address that at the end of the session okay so in this week, we are going to talk about functions and a little bit coming back to memory addresses and stack. Um, and we are going to emphasize array and pointers in this. As you build out your project program, you will find the need for array and pointers um, and how we can implement that in LC3. OK. And I think previously we touched a little bit on pointer uh, on how we can use the register to really point to a location where your data would be. And so we're going to revisit that in this particular session. So to start, we're going to hit chapter six or chapter 14, and then we're going to go to chapter 16 after. So in chapter 14, it looks at or it explains the function and what function would be. And in LC3, we've been covering subroutine and how to jump to subroutine for function call. And so to really expand on function, function is simply a way for us to incorporate tasks into a program. And we can um, define the function for smaller, simpler subcomponent of the program or be able to reuse the function. And as you learn in programming, function is really designed to return values. Um, in some case, you have function that won't return any values, and you see that in C and C++ as void. But if you do use a type-based function, like in this case, int factorial, right? So you have the data type specified, and that's because C and C++ and Java, it is strongly typed language. So you have to specify what kind of, uh, what type of data that it's going to accept for that function. So in C, this is going to allow us to implement the abstraction um, details about the task that we require the program to execute. It really allows you to control the overall flow on how you would be able to implement the function and call the function when it is needed. So in LC3, we saw this in the last lab that we would jump to the subroutine when we need to multiply or divide. You don't have to do it at the beginning or at an, in a certain section in particular. 
you just have to think about how your program is flowing and when that function should be used. And then you would later define what the function would be, the content of the function and what is to be computed within the function or if it is returning a value. So here it talks about how a function in C is a high level structure to the program. And it allows you to manage the flow and separate components that would be independently developed. And when we define a function or using the function in C, first we would prototype it. So you have to declare and prototype it at the top, and then you would later define the function on what it is. So here we would have the type, and this function uses integer, so we would have int, and we would give it a name. So your name needs to be unique, so it would we would be able to identify the function there. And then any argument that you would use, so whatever variable or container that you want to pass, you would put that into the parentheses here. And again, that would, you would have to use type for C. And so later on in the main, you can have the function call. So you, can, would, you would use the function name in the expression. So once you prototype it and then you can call the function and you can define the function. And in the recursion, you would see that in recursive function, it is a function that calls itself. So you can reuse that function continuously. And if you returning the value, what it is, is it's gonna output the value or return the value. And then we can use that value to compute again, right? And in the case where if you want to use recursive function for things like Fibonacci, um, you know, sequencing or, you know, any other type of task. So in the definition of the function, you would then need to state, right, the type and the arguments, and it needs to match the function declaration as far as the type. And so in C, we would include the body of the function inside the curly, the curly brace. Okay, and then if you want it to be returning a value, okay, then you would say return. And we see this in subroutine for LC3 that when we define the function or the subroutine, right, a lot of times in the case where if we implement a loop like this, we need to make sure that we initialize I and then we want to specify the counter value and how it would be incrementing so we would simply add right and we would set up a branch so that way it would branch when it finished out to finish out that loop and we would count it we would count it up and then we would also need a place where we would store back the value and then return our result by using ret and lc3 so for the definition it would entail right the arguments the type and what that function is designed to do and so when you prototype it at the top you simply declare what it is but you need to define it down the line so in our questions for number one you can simply state what's put what's on page one it asks you to explain the functions in c programming and so in c function provides the abstraction high level details it gives high level structure to the program. It allows you as a programmer to control the flow of the program. And it enables separable independent development. It is used to achieve a task. So if you're doing a bubble sort program, for example, you want to think about how you would use a function to be able to compare the values, right? So that way you can arrange the data to be output in ascending order from low to high. And looking at the mechanism for the bubble sort, right? It's looking at one value compared to another. So how you would write it in C, you would then need to think about how you would be able to incorporate that in LC3 
in the case that if you apply the condition like if else, then you think about how you would branch. And how you can apply the conditional or the iterative mechanism in your functions using branching. And so with that, we're going to come back here. So when you work with function, you would see that the compiler, when you use it in C, the compiler would need to know how to return based on your argument types and the number of arguments. Because when you compile, what happens is the variable that you are used to you using to pass in the function, those get pushed onto the stack. And so it's going to refer to those variables, right, or the location of those variables to be able to pull the data that it would need to use for your function. And when we think about how, how stack is being used for the function call, then we can look at the manual process on how we would implement that in LC3. Okay, so here shows you some example on how you would prototype the function, call the function, and define the function. Okay, here they use the word declaration, but in most programming textbook, right, for C, C++, you would see that that's the, the, the verbiage for that would be the prototyping of your function. Now, the difference between the definition and the prototyping is that the the, when you define a function, right, you would have a body of the function where, you know, what it's supposed to do with the prototyping, you would use the semicolon at the end of the statement and you simply put the type and the function name and any arguments that the parameters that you would use. So the variables that we're passing for the function here. In the definition of the function, you don't include the semicolon for C. Right, so you repeat the same thing here, omit the semicolon, and then you would use the curly brace to specify what that function is to do by including the body of the function, okay? Now, different than C, you see other languages like Python, right? You would use, when you define the function, you don't really have to prototype the function, but you can define the function and then you can call it in main which is at the end of the program, or you can say if namespace is main, and then you would call it there. You can call it inside another method and so on. So Python is definitely a little bit more flexible in how the syntax of that would be and how it is implemented in the actual program. So here, when you implement the function, you need to think about you know, the calling of the function and the process of the call function. So the information for each of the function needs to be specified or defined and the arguments for your and are your, your local variables. That means the variables that you declare inside that function needs to be included, okay? And with that, the activation record would then be stored onto the runtime of stack. So that gets pushed onto the stack and that's how it's able to use the data um, that is stored inside those variable for your function. So here you can see when we're calling the function, it's gonna push a new activation record. And this activation record contains the list of your arguments, right? So container like variables and arrays, and the addresses that's associated with those containers, then it's gonna be able to copy the values into the argument. So that's how it's able to retrieve the data from those location and put it in the function. So when you call the function, it's able to compute and give you the result from the stack, okay? So after that, when you have the call function and execute the, the code, it's gonna take the re return result from uh, the activation record. And then after that, it's gonna pop the activation record from the stack because the stack 
grew when when the function is called. That means that your your memory for your stack, right? It's it's then storing the new activation record, your arguments. And once it's called, once the code is executed, then it's going to put the result in the activation record and it's going to pop that activation record from the stack. So it can make room for the next function. Then it's going to return. So in calling the function, you would see that these processes, right, happen. And in the call function, that's part of this, right? You would see that at the end, this is what happens, okay? So the runtime stack, it would have the local variables that we define in the function. That's gonna be stored onto the stack in the activation record. So that activation record, think of it like a file where it would have the local variables inside that function. So here, when you're looking at the illustration that's shown on this page, you would have a frame pointer, which is your register five, and it's gonna point to the location of your activation record. That's how it's gonna be able to see it. And that activation record is gonna store your local variables for the function. And so when the function is called, that activation record is then pushed onto the stack. So that means that it's gonna use the, that file, right, for that location and that's how it's able to retrieve. And so the compiler does this when you compile a C or C++ program. And so when you do an RET or when you do a return, then that activation record gets popped off the stack. And so the stack shrink back to its original size as, you know, things are already been removed, your activation record been removed, and it's going to make room for the next. So when we look at that here, R5 is here, right? And then it's when we push the activation record here, and R6 is always going to be the top of the stack. That's the register that we use to be able to look at how our stack is going to be growing and shrinking, what's added. So your R5 is going to be here because your R5 really points to the activation record that stores your variable. So once that get pushed on, that's going to look like this during the call. And after the call, right, we're going to pop the activation record off of that region of the memory. So R5 is back down here now in the main because you know you call in main. So it started out with the main and then it's gonna go to the stack section where your activation record would be. Once that gets pop off, it's gonna come back down to the main again. And that just continues. So if you have multiple function and if you call multiple function, the next one, it's gonna do that again. Okay. And so for our activation record in another view. So here is our function called no name. And we would have, we pass int A, int B, and then we also define the local variable X, Y, and W, and we're gonna return Y. So your local variable right here is gonna get pushed onto the stack, Y, X, and W, okay? And remember that R5 points to your activation record. And so your local variables are here. Then you have the dynamic length, the return address, and the return value. This is for bookkeeping purposes. That's how it's able to bring the return address to register seven so it can retrieve the return value. And then your arguments, right? Your variables that's being passed here, A and B, that also gets added to the stack. And so in the activation record, you see these things. And so it would look something like this, right? In an abstract level, it would be like a table where it would have, oh, A is an integer and this is the offset value and the scope and so on. So the scope really pertain to the function name that you define. The offset here, right? 
would be the values that it would indicate for the variables or the parameters. And then you would have the type in the case of C and then your variables name, okay? Now in the bookkeeping area, that's your dynamic link, your return address and your return value. That's the next section. So the return value, it's gonna associate a memory space that store the return value for that function, okay? And so it tells you here that space for the value returned by the function allocated, even if the function does not return a value. So in the case where if you're using void, right, and a function name, like void no name, and we're not returning for, from our function when we're using void, it, the compiler is designed to still allocate that space in the stack even though you don't need to return, okay? And then your return address is a save pointer that will point to the next instruction in calling the function. So that would be where it's gonna put that onto our register seven in case the you would have a next function call or you jump to the, the, the next subroutine. So this return address is just gonna be able to go to the next instruction on your code and also be able to set up for another function call, okay? Your dynamic link is the caller's frame pointer and this is used to pop the activation record off the stack. So it, it uses this link to remove the activation record from the stack so it shrinks back down again, okay? So from C, when we look at this into LC3, all right, um, you have to think of how you would be able to use the register to set up the calling, okay? So here, what we do is we want to make sure that we incorporate a register. So here we initialize register zero, we add in a 10 because that's a value, right? Like I want to say int, you know, variable is, is 10. So that's going to be your R here and that's 10. That's just a value, that immediate value that we initialize. So it needs to bring that data here. And then we are going to subtract one from register six because it's going to move down one as you add the activation record with your variables. So those get there. So it's gonna move down on the, the memory array. It's gonna push it down one. And we want to store. So here we're gonna store from register six to register zero, okay? So your new register six is gonna be here, okay? And it made room for 10, so your new register six is gonna be here. Now, then we are going to push the first argument because your argument, um, it needs to be introduced into the stack so that way it can handle your argument. So we would then load zero or load register five to register zero. And then again, we are going to take this right, move it down one. So you add it 25 here, we introduce another immediate value. And then again, we're gonna store. So the mechanism for this is when you do a push, right, for the first argument, which is gonna be your, um, your R, then you gotta push it down. So think about how it, it will coil down and then you're gonna push the second argument, which is gonna be your Q. So that way these values are gonna be added. So those are gonna be your argument here. Okay, whatever the variable that you used to pass. Then, um, so your dynamic link, it's gonna use that to be able to remove the activation record after your function is called. And then the return address, this location here is gonna be copy over to register seven and it's gonna be able to retrieve the value and that's how it's gonna bring that into your return here. Or I'm sorry, return here for the K, 
Okay. So the K and the M also gets pushed on there, but they didn't include that, that in the picture here. So, and then for your second um, function, your int A gets pushed on here and so on. So what you would see is that every time that the function call, just keep in mind that your activation records keep track or it stores the information for your arguments and your local variables. And then when it's done using it, it's gonna, it's gonna push off and it's gonna go to the next line and getting ready for the next JSR or the next function call. Okay, any question? So let's take a look at the next part where it talks about callee functions, okay? Now here it shows you that we're gonna add negative one to register six, which is here, okay? And in order to push the return address, we're gonna add it again, negative one to register six, because remember that your register six, it is a meter. It's a gauge on where the top of the stack would be, okay? So as you, as you add values, we need to push it down, right? So add, when you, when you add the argument, or local variable, it needs to be able to push it down. So that way it would be able to access your return address. And so after that, to do the return address, we need to store whatever that register, that register six has into register seven. Okay. And for the dynamic link, because we are, this is your caller's frame pointer, that's how we're gonna pop off the, the activation record. Again, because we're moving register six, so we're gonna subtract it again with negative one. And then we're gonna store it to register five because register five is a pointer to your data value. Okay. Now I understand that it is a little bit hard to visualize this, right? But we you have to think about how things are pushed onto the stack and how it would be able to use a certain region of the memory to be able to say, okay, this is um, where your local variable is gonna be stored and as it gets added on, right, it's gonna grow or shrink or shrink when it pops up. Okay, so we're gonna push it down when we add on the values and we need to point to where those values would be. And then we're gonna add negative one to register six and put it on to register five. So now we have to set a new uh, frame pointer, which is gonna be your R5 and R6. And this is where it's gonna associate your, um, your local variable, your M and your K to your activation record. And so how, after that, we would then have a space because we have two local variables, M and K, then we're now gonna subtract two from R6. So R6 is now having two additional uh, local variables get added, okay? And so let's pause there and come back here. For number two, we need to describe the process of runtime I'm stack when calling the function after it and after it is called. So when the function is called, its activation record is pushed onto the stack. And we should know what the activation record contains, right? I talked about local variable and arguments. So when it returns, the activation record content is no longer needed. So it's then popped off the stack. So you you first push it on and then you have to pop it off for after the return. So then for three, we can describe the functionality of the return value. The return address dynamic link and the activation record keeping process. So the return value is memory location for the value returned by the function even if it doesn't need to return. The return address 
is your save pointer for the next instruction in calling function. Okay. So your return address, because after it returns, it needs to pick up, right, for the next calling function. Then your dynamic link is just your frame pointer that's used to pop the activation record off the stack after we return. Any question? So let me like this. And again, you can find this on your note pages. Okay, so I simply took that from the note pages. But when we write down the answer, just think about what we're putting down and making sure that you understand this. Okay. Because without really diving deeper into this, it's a little bit harder to implement stack if you don't understand the process of what's happening in the memory location and what, what is added and what's being removed. All right, so here it also shows you how dynamic link and return address is used, like what we just put down. So when, after you return K, your K is then copied into the return value. So, in the back, if you're looking at LC3, right, it's going to load register five, which contains the data for the return into register zero. And since we load, we have to store. So we need to store that to register zero. And so that will be your R6. So remember, R6 is your register six is the gauge on where the top of the stack would be, right? And then we need to pop it. So we would then pop the, your local variable that was added on earlier. So then, because earlier when we push it in, remember we subtract one, just think about how you, it coils down one, it's, it's growing downward. So now when we pop it, we've got to add one. And then we are going to load R6 uh, to R5 for your dynamic link. So your dynamic link simply is an address right? And it's going to use that address to, to pop off the activation record. And, and then we are going to add one again, because earlier we subtract one for R6 when we push that activation record on with the dynamic link. So we are going to do a plus one here. So it's going to shrink up. Then we are going to pop the return address. Um, and remember that register seven is in charge of, of return. So you are going to load what's in register six to register seven, which is here, right? You can follow the arrow. And then you're going to add register six again. And again, we are going to shrink it up, okay? Because earlier when we push it down, now we're going to bring it up. And so when you, after that, you can do the RET. So here is the return. Now, So after we have to jump to the subroutine, it's going to pick up, right, on the next instruction. So here it illustrates on how you can resume the caller function, right? So the top of the stack, it's going to then point to the return value, which is 217 from that program. And then we need to store register 5 to register 0 and be able to pop the value. So again, we're going to do an add one to register six. So if you're using register six, which is the common practice for LC3, to gauge your stack, then if you start with subtract one when you're pushing it in at the end, you're always going to do the opposite when you do a plus one to it and then put it back onto register six. So if you need to pop the return value, which is 217, it's now here, okay? And so after that, we're gonna pop the arguments. So earlier we subtract two from register six. Now when we pop, we're gonna do the add two because there are two arguments that we use, right? The K and the M. So now we're gonna, we're gonna pop it back up again. 
So your stack would then shrink up after you pop everything from the activation record. But when you first start it, when you push in the activation record, you're going to expand it. It's going to grow downward. And so that's why when you think about that, right, when we add, we subtract one. And when we introduce the local variable, or the arguments, we, we would then subtract depending on how that gets added into your, your function. So here it talks about the procedure for your subroutine. So when you implement your subroutine, right? First, we would have the caller push the arguments, okay? That means that last to first because it's last in first out. So it's gonna go from last to first, okay? So when you're thinking about here, I'm gonna, sorry about the whiplash, right? Come back here. When you're thinking about int volta, right? And then these are the arguments, your Q and your R, right? Your Q is here and your R is here, right? It's gonna take this and push in first and then your Q because this is last in first out, okay? So when you think about that coming back down here, it's going to go last to first when it pushes the arguments. Then when you have a JSR jump to subroutine, which is a function call, when you invoke the subroutine, it's going to then allocate the return value where it's going to push register seven and register five because register five holds the value for the return and that needs to store back to register seven. Who has the address for this okay so they go together then your local variables have to be introduced so it's going to make space for your local variable that gets pushed on okay and because when we invoke the jsr it's going to execute the function code it stores the result to the location once it uses the local variable and your arguments, first it's going to pop off the, the local variables. So it's going to pop R5 and R7. And then, so when the callee returns, it's going to jump R7 because R7 has the return address. And then it's going to load the value and then pop the argument. So it's done with the arguments now. Okay, so the local variables get pop off first, then it's gonna pop off your, your arguments. And then it's gonna use the, it's gonna use the R7 address where it's gonna pick up on the next instruction. So that's how it's able to resume on the next line of your code. Okay. So here you can take that section and you can put that into the next question. So I asked you to describe the implementation process of LC3 subroutine call. We just talked about that. It pushes the argument, the caller in invokes the subroutine. The callee would then we have the return value which pushes R7 and R5. It creates space for your local variable because we have to push that on right after the invoke. When you do a function call, it executes the code. It stores the result in a location where it would be able to point to from R5 and bring that, associate that with R7. So R7 points to R5 and that's how it's able to retrieve the value. Then after that, it's gonna pop the local variable from R and pop R5 and R7, jumps to R7, where it's gonna have the return value address and access it. So it's gonna pop that off and pop the arguments off. So that's how it's able to resume. So in this week, when you do the lab, you're gonna see how stack is used. So you can see how that is written in LC3. Okay, now the example in the lecture that the authors, they put together the presentation that I include in the visual, right? 
uh, you can do it that way, but we can we can also implement the stack in you know using register six and how we would you know push it with using subtract one and then so on. So you do see some similarity with that where we can load and, and store and so on. Okay. So now let's talk about um, array and pointers. So I'm gonna come back to the question shortly. Okay, so let's go over the pointers. So as you learn in C, C++, Java, and other programming language, um, pointer is simply an address of a variable in memory. It allows you to indirectly access the variable. Okay, so we can point to a variable that contains the value, right? Um, now, when you use a pointer, all it is is just an address of a container. Now, the address is different than the value, okay? And we can quickly access the value by pointing to the value, okay? So you would go to the location that will point to another location that has the value. So here, what you can see is that we have register two, which contains an address of uh, the first location and register two is at hex 3100. The value is this. And so when we use that, we're gonna point to the value from an address, okay? So it's able to read the value and be able to compute at the sum. It's gonna increment the R2 until all the numbers are being processed. So then your register two here is a pointer because it contains the address where the data would be. Okay, so you simply in LC3 or assembly, you can use a register to, con to store or have an address of where that value would be. And that's how you use a pointer. Now, if we want to use a pointer in swap where we would be able to swap the value, okay? So swap would need addresses of variables, we would now have more than one address. And it would be from the activation record. So here, what you have is you have first val is three, second val is four. And then so your value B and your value A, we need to swap it, right? So we would have four and three. Okay, so before the call, it looks like this. And your register six is here. So when you do the, after the call for the swap, what you have to do is you have to create a temporary location, right? Where, where that three is gonna go because in the swap, it, there's no magic about it, right? You cannot put it into a no space. You have to find another location to put the three so that way you can switch the four with the three, okay? And I, when I teach programming in, in, in C or Python, right, I talk about the triangular move, is that when you have two variable, variable A and variable B, it stores three and four, and you need to swap them, right? You can't just take them and, and switch them over. What you have to do is you have to take the three and do a triangular move. So you have to take a three and put it into temp, take the four, put it into A, and then take the temp, which has three and put it into B. That's how you swap the values, right? So because we can't magically just switch them, you have to make sure that things go into a location where you would be able to retrieve it. And you see a lot of this when you know we're using dynamic memory allocation type of, you know, we implement this for the algorithm. Um, I've done it with like Fibonacci. I've done it so instead of using recursive function, we can implement that with loops and conditional statement. So 
you would see that with sort and search algorithm and so on. So you have to set up a temporary location where you can switch the value. But what if we use a pointer for it, right? Data can stay in the same static spot, right? We just then have to update the addresses for the pointer where it would point to B as A and A as B, which is more convenient than taking up additional location to be able to move your data around, okay? So then here it talks about how you would be able to use a pointer and in C or C++, the way that you declare a pointer is to first type it, then you would use the asterisk and then the pointer name, okay? And so when you type it, you would know that it is a it is a pointer by using the data type and then the asterisk. Okay. So for the operators, you would see that how it would be able to return the value when it's pointing by B. And so we just use P to be able to point to what the return value would be. Okay. But if you use the ampersand, right? It actually is a reference. So it is an address of that variable. It is not where the data is. It is just the address of the variable Z. And if you took CIS 5 or 17A, we talked about this in those classes, right? And sometimes student gets confused in those classes about you know, how pointer works compared to reference variables and the address of the variable. So when you're using this operator, that is just for the address of that variable, not where the data is, okay? Where you're using the pointer, it can point to the re a certain value, okay? So that's how we would use the pointer. And so let's look at this program in C and then how that would be correlated in, in LC3. So you have int i, right? And then your pointer is your PTR. You initialize i with four, so i is four, right? And your pointer is the address of variable i. And so you would have your pointer is pointer added one, okay? So here, this allows you, and you see the notes here, it reads the content of the memory at the address stored in the pointer. And for this, when you declare that, your pointer is the result into the memory of the address that's stored in the pointer. So if you look at the LC3 side, right? First, we gotta set up the I, right? So we can load I and then so on, but we would pick up right here. So you would then clear register four, which represent I, and you would then add four to register zero. So register zero now is I and, and four is added to zero. So you're here. Then you need to store, right? So you would take register five, okay? and store it to register zero, so store in I. So we have to store it. Now we are going to do the reference of I. So we are going to add zero to five. So that's gonna be the address of I to register zero. So you would take register five, which was stored, you're gonna add it to register zero, and then we would store it again, but this time to store it in the pointer, we're gonna subtract one, okay? Then for the pointer, because now your register zero is the pointer, so we would load because we store here, the next part to, to have this right here, you are going to load, right? The opposite of store. And now you're gonna do subtract one again. Okay, and then you have to load the content to the pointer. So the content of the pointer, I'm sorry, to another register. So you're gonna take the pointer content and put it onto register one. And then we are going to add one 
to register one. Then we're going to store the result to register one. Okay. Okay. Because register zero simply just point. So you have to store it to another register. Any question? Now you can also use pointer as argument. So when you pass the pointer in the function, it allows you to use the function to read, write the memory outside of the activation record. So things that don't get pushed onto the stack with activation record, you can also use pointers as our argument where it's gonna go to another location to be able to access the memory for, for data. Okay, and so when you use that as arguments, you simply would say, right, you know, it's a pointer, we're using the asterisk, so the type, right, the variable name, and then since it's a pointer, we would use the asterisk, okay. And so in this case, you would see first val and second val, so in the case here, we would have, it is type integer, it's going to pass the addresses of the variable instead of the actual data, okay? So it's gonna be able to point to, right? It uses that address to point to what that data would be for that argument. So in a visual aspect, you would see it like this. So your register six, this is your first val, which is this right here, it has an address. Your second val right here, right? The first val is going to point to value A, which is your register five, has three. Second val, this address is going to point to value B. Okay, unlike the other one, we saw that the actual data, right? So for the pointer, it just simply uses memory address. So on the right side, you would see how the address is used. So for the value B, your value B is here, right? Your, that would be associated with this address, right? We use this address to point to value B. So that means that we have to take R5, right? And, and subtract one, and put it on register zero, because remember register zero is our pointer, okay? So we're gonna subtract one and put it onto register zero. Then we're gonna do a push and register six is our meter for our stack. So as we have one added or one push down, we're gonna do a subtract one for register six. Then we're gonna take register six and sort to register zero. After that, we repeat the same thing for the value A. So why I don't put the A first before the B, remember last in, first out. So I have to do the B first and then the A. Okay, this and then this. So that means that I would have, next I would do the same thing for A. So then I would take zero, add it with register five and put it on register zero for our pointer. And then we are going to push register six down by one. So we're gonna subtract one from register six. So now I have two, okay? Because remember, it's growing downward, even though the picture just showed that it's pushing, right? So your, your second is right here, right? Your first is right here for A. Then we are going to then store register six onto register zero. And that's how you using passing pointer in LC3. Okay. So this is what the compiler handles, right? When you have the pointer there. Any question? So we talked about swap, right? You can also use, um, you can also use reference variable or the addresses, right? For your function. So let's come back here. So for number five, it asks you, how is a pointer implemented? What does it contain, right? So 
the way that you implement it in LC3 is that you're gonna use the register to point to an address location. Then you are going to increment in the location as the pointer is used. And so when I say increment, that's loosely because you have to think about how you, when you, when you add in that, that address, right? We subtract one because it's growing down. So you are going to then subtract one. Okay. So it, it might be misleading there, but you would increment in the memory location. So it's going to go down one. Then we are going to use load and store to load the content and store the result between the registers, okay? And so when you look at the last, when, when the last time we were looking at how we're using to pass arguments or we're using the pointers to point to the data, right? It is exactly that. We use a register to, to store the address of where the data would be. And so that means that we need to add it to the register. Then once that happens, we're gonna subtract one because it's then now pushing down. Then we're gonna load and store the instruction because first, right, if you store then you load, so you use load and store to be able to pull the, the data content from the pointer to find your, to use it in your function, okay? And so for six, why should pointer be passed in the function? It allows the function to read or update memory outside of the activation record, okay? So if you're using a pointer and you pass the pointer in the function, you can access memory that's outside of the activation record by doing that. Because remember that your, your data, the way that we store things in storage is not sequential, right? Um, it's not gonna be like all together in sequence. There are times that we would have data that would be outside of, of you know, uh, that, that group or that group of addresses in the memory because it's dynamically writing. So it's gonna throw things in the fastest way that it can. It might be over here, it might be over there and so on. And data don't really move around. I think, you know, just a lot of the times people think that data, right, gets put in there. And then when we delete data, you know, it gets rid of it. Even when you delete files, your, your data is still there. It's just the way that it associates that file with that data is gone. So when we retrieve things, you know, and if you're looking at forensic, they can still go into that section of your storage and be able to retrieve it because everything is stored dynamically and we have to use, find ways to quickly access the data by pointing to it, by saying, oh, this is the address where it's gonna be and it's able to find it. Because if you think about how your file is stored on your drives and your, your USB and things like that, your data is it's not all together, it's in pieces, right? Like your homework file is in, it's scattered everywhere. And so it uses a way to be able to associate the addresses where that the content of the file would be. So when you open the file, right, it uses a group of addresses to be able to pull it. And so the same concept would go into programming in that we have to be able to access all of these data and the, the, the way that we can access dynamic you know, storage is to think about how we can point to all of these locations. Instead of putting them all together, we can say, hey, I can pass it as an argument to be able to associate you know, outside of the stack, outside of the activation record where my data would be, okay? So any questions? Okay, so the next part, we're gonna talk about null. Okay, so here, right, it gives you another visual on how you would be, we talked about how we swap already, where we have to create another location, right? And in this one, when you look at that section, because we talked about how we would set up the, the, the second and the first vowel already, 
but simply if you have a temp variable, a third variable to be able to put that value when you swap, um, you would then need to just load the register, okay? And then you would point to the address, right, of the data for that temp variable, okay? So we use register zero as a pointer. So we would take that, that address and we load it to register one. So that way it would point to three because that's where your data is, right? It's three. So it has this address. And then from there, we can store it, right? With R5 would you know, have the three and we would then store it to register one. Okay, and that's how you use register to, to, to uh, implement the, the temp variable with the pointer. Okay, so let's talk about null pointer. So null pointer is points to nothing, right? We declare a pointer, but we don't have anything yet. Okay, and you see this in, in C and C++ a lot, right? When you, when you write a program, you implement data structure often that, you know, every time that you implement data structure, you know, you would see that pointers use and no pointers use, right? So if I'm using a double link list, um, you know, a single link list, you see pointers being used. So no pointer is just a pointer that doesn't point to anything yet, right? We might use it down the line, but we want to set it up. So first you declare that variable as a pointer. So you would say int, right? And then asterisk P, that's a pointer variable. Then you would say that that is a null pointer because then you would then assign it null. Okay. And so here it tells you that null is a predefined macro that contains a value that is non null pointer, it should never hold. So often null is zero, right? Because the address is zero. It is not a legal address, but eventually it will have some form of address. So when you when you program, you would declare the null pointer and then you would then later use that pointer for to, to do other things. Okay, so that's how you use that in C. Now you can also have arguments um, when you pass an address, okay? So here we would then use this, right? So scan F, this is a C thing, okay? To be able to implement like what you would see with like print F, scan F. So it's gonna read what data is input. But instead of actual data, we're gonna reference the variable that has the data. Okay. So it's going to read the decimal integer and store it in data in and data in is the variable that stores it. So we're going to reference that variable. Okay. So now here, when you declare your pointer, we saw this already, we would have type and then, you know, your variable name would before that we would put an asterisk. If you do a reference variable, you would use the ampersand sign. So I hope that when you leave this class, even though it was touch and go for you in CIS5, right? I know, okay. Or it's been a while since you learned C++ or you didn't really grasp the concept. And I hope that this particular piece will reinforce or review some of the things that you've learned in those classes, okay? Because without using pointers and reference variable or no pointer, right? Implementing data structure in C++ is gonna be difficult, okay? And so now what you would see is that instead of using the data directly, we can reference where the container that would store the data or point to the data by using its address, okay? So when you're using a reference, you have to dereference, 
Okay. So when you have one asterisk with a variable name like this, that would give you the content of the memory location pointed by var. Using the double asterisk, that will be the content of the memory location pointed by the memory location by var. So it's using two addresses. So we're going to take one address, point to another address that's going to point to var. And then if we want to look at the content of the location three, then it will just be this asterisk three. Any question? So for seven, we can say that the purpose of your null pointer in C is to point to a variable that is not assigned any value or any addresses yet. Okay, that's what the null pointer does. Then null indicates zero, which is the address is zero. It's not a legal address, but it will have a legal address later on in the program. Any questions regarding null dereferencing pointers and so on? Okay, so let me, I'm sorry, I'm gonna move this down so I, you have the complete thing, but. So here I also added that for, to check for the null pointer before accessing any pointer variable, we can perform error handling in pointer related to the code. That's gonna dereference the pointer variable only if it is not null. Okay, so when it is not null, then we it will dereference or we need to dereference. When you pass a null pointer into a function, we don't want to pass any valid address. Okay, therefore it was zero. Okay, so all of these points for your null pointer are also included in notes, but you also probably covered this in other classes as well. Any question regarding no? So as we touch on uh, on referencing and your pointer declaration, so here in C, the difference between when you're using the asterisk var and the ampersand var is that when you are using the asterisk var for that is when you declare, okay? When you're using the ampersand var, it is used for reference. And in many books, that will be referred to as reference variable, okay? So the pointer needs to be dereferenced with the asterisk in order to access memory location that it points to. Okay, so when you reference something, you have to dereference it. Whereas reference can be used directly. Okay. Any question? All right. So now we're gonna to touch on array. If you don't have any question, we're gonna move on to array. Okay, so an array is a container that contains uh, more than, so it's a container group of elements, right? And in depending on the programming language, right? Uh, some programming programming language would use array, and others would use list, like Python. And then Java, you got the array list, which is equivalent to your dynamic array in C C plus uh, in C plus plus. Okay, so your list of values is arranged in sequential order. 
starting from the first element, that's your index zero, right? And let's say that if we have five, uh, five elements, we would start with index zero and go to index four, okay? You can have an array of phone numbers. You can have an array of names, which could be strings. You can have array of integers and so on. So in C, you would first use the type and then your array name. So we need to give it a name and then the number of elements go here. Okay. Now to access individual elements, you would then have your variable name or your array name and then the index value. And remember that they are sequential. So you would start with zero and you would go to the end of the array if it's five elements that will be four for the index. So now, um, as how array is going to push on your activation record. So let's say that I have 10 elements for my array call grid. And my first element is zero and the last element is nine. That gives me 10 elements, okay? Because they are sequential, it will be consecutive like this when it goes on to your activation record. Okay, so let's visualize that. So that means that the first element, which is grid zero here, is at the lowest address of the allocated space. That means that the address value is at the lowest. Remember that it's growing downward, right? So this first one is the lowest. <clears throat> and it tells you here that if the grid is the first variable allocated, then register five will point to grid nine, which is the last element. That's how it's gonna be able to determine how many elements is in your array by using a register here, right? So if I have 100, register 5 would go to grid 99 because that would be the last element in my 100 elements array, correct? Okay. So then when we look at LC3, right? So here we would then say how we can make it a 10 elements array, okay? So first we need to establish what that first element would be. And so here we would reference where that first element is in your register zero, okay? So that means that we gotta move down nine or we're gonna subtract nine to bring it back to register uh, to element zero, right? Yeah, index zero. So because we have 10 elements. And then now we want to represent X is gonna be the fourth element plus one. So that means that we're gonna take three, which is the index value, put it to register at load it to register zero and then put it on register one to do this grid three, right? Then we got to add the plus, the add the one here. So we're going to plus one to register one. And so now we would have register one is going to represent X. So we're going to take R5, subtract 10 to show that it's through 10 arrays then store it onto register one, okay? It is a little tricky when you think about that, right? So think about where the position of the first one is and how you can reference that. Then now we can access the individual element, right, from that first one, that first element. So if I need to access the fourth element, 
I got to move from that to three, index three, and then I, I'm going to add one to it. This is just a plus one here, right? And then I need to store in the, because it's 10 elements. So we're going to need to store from register five to register one. Now, if we wanted to say the, the seventh element is five, right? We're going to clear register zero. We're going to add five to register zero. Because previously we had register one as, so we need to represent where the first element would be or reference it. So then we would take register five, subtract nine. We're going to move nine down to show you where that, that first element would be and put it onto register one. And then we have to show that it is the six element. So you would then take six and start with register one to register zero. Okay, so that would give you the six element is at register zero. Okay, so here it shows you how you can work with elements and then to initialize value to the elements or take the elements and then you can have it increment, you can access, you know, using the variable as an index value and so on. So as you look through this, you're gonna see that, you know, we're doing the same thing. Your, your reference of the grid zero, which is your first element, is always going to be subtracting nine because it's zero through nine. You have to take down, go down nine to access your, your first element. So if I have a hundred elements, I would do a minus, right? The value multiple times to make it 99, okay? I cannot subtract 99 all at once, so I have to do it multiple lines and combine to give me 99, okay? So it takes, you know, a few more lines to do that. If I have five elements array, then I would subtract four to reference my first index, correct? Because you go from zero to four to make it five elements, okay? So here, what we're doing is we're gonna load right, your negative 10 to register five and put it on register zero. So this, if you look at the prior section, that's gonna be your X. So we have to, you know, represent X here, okay? And we would start with the reference of the first element and then we would take X, which is in register zero. And the first element, we would add it together and put it back on register one. Okay. So that would reference X element. Then we are going to now access the actual element. So your R2, so once you have that, then you're going to load register one to register two. And then you're gonna add two because we need to um, do the plus two here. Because we have to say grid X plus one is equal to grid X plus two. So you add the two. Because at this point here, you have grid X. So you do the add two. Okay. So as you go through line by line, it gives you the explanation, but you have to think about how you can visualize that, right? We've got to go back. We've got to reference the, the first element. That's where we start, just the same thing as here. Okay. Any question? So now we're going to answer number nine. How do you create a 10 element array? Okay, to really summarize this, number one, you need to use the registers to point to the first and the last index of your array. 
on the memory grid. And you would increment by adding one to increase the memory grid for each of the index. So if I need to move from the first index to the second index, I simply add the one because physically we're going from one location to the next. All right, so now let's let's take that into the addresses, okay? So before I answer 10, let's come back here. Okay. So in some case, you need to use string and that, you know, in LC3, we can implement string with characters. And in, in C, what we can do is we can have an array and that array can store string. So all that is, is that we need to allocate the space for string and string is null terminated and string is a group of characters, right? So that means that we have to have the null termination at the end of the characters, okay? So you have to think about how many characters is in that string. And if you have a, an array of strings, right? Um, when you define that, each of the string would take up one location of address or one word. Okay, so if I have three strings, that will be three words and they are all sequential and they are null terminated, right? So, now comparing an array to a pointer, you know that C uses the square brace to indicate the array. We can see that this is a 10 element array compared to a pointer. But we still have the same type here for both. So char for character. And this is a pointer compared to the array here. Okay. So if we're using the pointer, right? So for example, I have C CPTR is word and it's gonna point to the index zero, which is the first element of word, right? Now, if we use this and we have it plus one, then that is just gonna be your word plus one. Okay, so if your CPTR is word, that's going to reference the first element, okay, or the first string, then you're going to have CPTR plus n, that's just going to be word plus n. So here we would see that it will be plus one. So it's going to reference the index there, okay. So it shows you a little bit difference on how you can, the comparison between the array and your pointer. So the pitfall is that a lot of times we don't, we have the overrun for the array limits. So if I implement the 10 elements array, right, I can use the for loop, I can access each of the elements by looping through. Okay. So they tell you here that there's no checking at the runtime or the compile time to see if the, re the reference is the array bound. Now, when you declare an array, you have to specify the size of the array, which happens here. So if the compiler doesn't see this, right? Now I know that you can implement dynamic array, but you have to, say that it is a dynamic array because if you leave this empty in C, C++, right, the compiler is gonna complain. It's gonna say, I don't know what that is, right? You gotta tell me how many elements because remember that it gotta put that onto the stack. It needs to create that section of the memory. So if you don't put a number there, right, where you would specify what type of array it is and, and so it's going to complain. It's going to say, I don't know how many elements you want me to put on the stack. Okay. So 
in that, what's really happening with the addresses is this, okay? So when we, we work with the low level, we have to think about like, oh, well, this is the number of, of elements that we need and this is the number of addresses that we need for the array, okay? So we would assume that one word per element. So if you have, if we need to access, right, the fourth element, we would add four base address and that will be the location of the fourth element. That's where it's gonna go, okay? So for your integer and your char, which is for character, it takes up one word, okay? Now, when you're using double, right, because it, we need to make, create more space to store that data, then it is double, right? Hence the name, we would double the word. So when you declare the type, what that does is it's going to determine whether it's going to take one word per element or two words per element. So when you say double, right, array name and then the number of elements, then it's going to it's going to determine whether it's going to take one word or two words per element. Okay? So in this example, since you're using double here or we use double here x, so this is our array x and we have 10 elements for this array. So they tell you here that it's going to be two elements or two words per element. So it's going to take 20 words for that array. And because array is sequential, so it's going to cut, right, 20 words. And each word is 16 bit. So that's going to, that's going to be the space for your array of 10 elements. Okay, so if we need to represent this and this is like accessing the, the fourth element or index three. So to access index three, since it's a double, you would take that value and multiply it by two. Your, so that means that your, your base address is gonna be six. Cause if I take three times two, I get a six. And so, I would need to add six to my base address to really be at the fourth element or at the index three. Okay, any question? All right, so let's do this. For number 10, it says, if your base address is hex 31 F zero and um, we need to allocate one word for each element. What is the address for the sixth element of the array, right? So this is for an integer or a character. So for the address calculation, you don't need to put this because I just put that on where I would reference it. So the address calculation depends on the element size. Right, int or char uses one word. So for the sixth element, we simply add six to the base address if it is int or char. So we would take hex 31 F0 plus hex six, which gives you hex 31 F6. Easy, right? So that means that it's to access the sixth element, this is the address. Now, if you're using a double, right? Let's say that you type it as a double for your array. It's gonna start at the base address, which is hex 31 F zero. And instead of adding six, we gotta take six multiplied by two, which is 12. And in hexadecimal, that's a C. So you would take hex C plus hex 31 F zero for the double type. Okay, I put that there. This is not the answer for the question, 
But in case you're curious about if you type double what where that would be, right? You take the base address and you you double the six, so you multiply it by two, and that's going to give you the value that you would add to the base address. Then for eleven, if your if you use a base address hex thirty one f a. And if we're using double word, which is double for each element, what is the base or the address for the fifth element? That's easy. We explained that in number 10, right? So you take the fifth element, which is index. Oh, I forgot about this, right? Because when we say six element, that's actually five. Okay, hold on. I think they have an error here too. So this is the total index three. Okay, so let's correct this, okay? Because the six element is your index is five, correct? So that means that you would add a five, which makes it this. I just caught that. Okay. But if you're saying the seventh element, which is then index six, then you would add the six. Okay. So that means that here, if we take five double that, that's going to be a, an A. So for the double type. And so for this one, we can't use it like this. So your fifth element is an index four because it starts at zero. I had it correct earlier and I changed it. So that means that you would do a hex eight. Let me recalculate this. So 31. Oops. 31 F A plus uh, 3202 is where it's going to be. Okay. A question. And so I did put this here prior, but I think I erased it and put something else there that was incorrect. So this is right. So when you fill, your fourth element is going to be, or I'm sorry, the fifth element, which is your index four, is going to be at 3202. And then your sixth element, which is index five, it's going to be at 3204. So you can see that it is increment of two, right? Because it is a double. So when you type it as a double, this is what happens, right? This is what the compiler sees that you are incrementing two words per index compared to when you're using int or char, it's using one word. So it's going to be just one to the next. So here um, in the single, right, in just a, a one word, let's say that you fill at um, 31, x31f5, right, for your, what is it, your six element. We're gonna do a dot fill here like this. So, that means that your seventh element, it's going to do a dot fill at hex 31 F6 like this. And that's for the integer or your chart. Okay, question. So now when you do C or Java, right, even C, C++, when you type, you you would understand, oh, well, it's going to take two words. I'm using double 
compared to if you do an int, it's going to take one word, or char, it's going to take one word. And then for string, when you're using string, right, it's null terminated. So however many characters plus one, that's going to give you the string fill. Okay, question. Okay, so now that was basically all the content for 14 and 16. We do have another lecture which covers the last part of the book. Okay, in the next round, uh, this week is going to be our last lab portion. I do have about, um, you know, close to 20 minutes. So I want to show you the code for another solution for um, lab 10, which is going to be your Zeller equation. I know some of you have challenges with it. It's usually come from like string definition that you add too many space or if you use tab for the white space, it, it didn't pull up. Um, but I want to show you another def uh, solution for Zeller equation since we have time. Okay, any question regarding the lecture? And I did record, re-record the, the lab and post it. Sorry, I posted it a little bit late. I thought I had uploaded it on YouTube, which I didn't. And then I, I, you know, I didn't remember that I linked it or not. So, all right, so let's come back. So one second, let me pull up my file. And also a reminder that if you haven't started looking into teams or post discussion to find your team, make sure that we do that um, and then get in touch with your classmates. If you need help in that, let me know. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So um, I didn't release this code, but if you want to, I can add another page and copy and paste the image on there for you. Okay, so I wanna show you another solution for this because it's a little different than what you've seen in the lab that we've done. Okay, let's screenshot or screen share here. So this is another way to address Zeller equation. Okay. Um, just like the other one, we originate at hex 3000. Okay. But instead of using the label and, and load the other way, um, we can start with jump to subroutine right away. So here I call the function month. Okay. So here we would have a subroutine to get M. Okay, so one second, let me go to the file so I can reference it so you can see what that means. I don't know why I'm looking at week 11. It's been a long day. All right, here's lab 10. Okay, so recall that our equation is this, right? And so here, what we need to do is we need to work outward from here, right? So we need to start with M and then we got to implement the condition for M, which is following like this, okay? Okay, so keep in mind that that's our equation. So now what you have is you would have a subroutine call month and we would define it down there. Okay, and then um, I would store M to register four. I have another subroutine called MULT because I think that's what the, the program asks for. And I would store new M to register three. 
And then I have a subroutine called div1. And I would star quotient of m to register 5. Then I have r, store that to register 3. And I have a second division, which is another division subroutine called div2. And then I, so I jump to subroutine there. I have a quotient D and remember these quotients are for the division, right? So once we tie it to a label, we would then need to be able to add it up later. It's a lot easier. That's gonna also be in register five. And R here is my remainder. So R is gonna be stored to register three, okay? So why do I have quotient of M and quotient of D? Okay, so if you look at the um, equation, right, I need to have a quotient of D because I'm dividing it by four, and I need to have a quotient of M because I have 13 M minus one divided by five, and that's why there's that quotient of M, okay? And then I need to have a quotient of C because we have this, right? We have, we have C divided by four, so similar to what you've seen previously. And then we use R as the remainder because when you divide, sometimes you don't have even result, right? You would have some leftover, which is your remainder. And then I would jump to subroutine called Zellers, which we add everything together. And then because in the equation, it says F equals, so we would have store F. Uh, into register six. And then we need to do F mod seven. Okay, so why? Because we have to convert it to days. So here is where we would have F mod seven. So that way we can output the day. So that's the next part. So we're gonna jump to that subroutine. And then for mod F, we're gonna store it into register five. And then your remainder, again, put it into register three. And you notice that we want to stick with the same register for the remainder so it doesn't become confusing. And then we're going to load um, R to register zero because we need to get the, the day to output. Okay. So, and then we would clear register three. We would copy register zero to register three because we load that earlier. And then we clear register four. We would subtract six uh, from register three and put it onto register four. And remember, register three came from earlier where we had three. Uh, we clear it and then we would copy. So we have a minus six. And six is to get the number of the week that we have. We have zero for Sunday and it goes until six. So in a way you can think about like that. We just set up an array for days. And then we would branch for invalid. And um, we would load effective address for days. And just like the other one, you got to define the days with the string and you got to count the characters. So inside the quotation, it has to be nine characters including the white space, okay? So if you're off you're using tab after your days, right? Like Sunday and then tab, it's not gonna work. So you gotta make sure that you use the space, space bar. And then we would do a conditional check for our loop. So here, when you add zero to register three, that is where it's gonna go to check. If it is zero, it's gonna go to display, okay? And in the loop, we're going to count it up to 10. Okay, why 10? So when you come back up here, right, because I have x plus 10, so it's going to check for 10. So then, um, let's see. And then I need to count down on the loop, so I would subtract one, and it's we're going to unconditional branch to the D loop. So it's going to come back and it's going to keep doing that, subtract one every single time. Okay. Then for the display, we would do the puts. We're going to load effective address for LF 
So that's going to have, you know, the, the string output. If it is invalid, we're going to stop the program. So it's going to halt. So similar to the other one, we would define the days with the strings here. It's going to be Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. LF, I'm going to fill it with hex A. Why A? Because A is for the 10 characters, right? Wednesday have nine characters with no termination. So you have to fill it with the hex A. And then for my X, I would have the input at hex F, uh, 31 F0, very similar to if that's a requirement. Your K is at hex 31 F1. Your C is at hex 31 F2. Your D is at hex 31 F3. Your M is at 31 F5. Your uh, new M is at hex 31 F6. Um, and then the quotient, same thing, right? Hex 3103, quotient of D, the next one, quotient of C, the next one. And then your F is at 3106, mod F is at 07, and R is at 31F4, okay? So unlike the other one, um, this one had the decoration of the data a little bit closer. I mean, you can put it at the end, Traditionally, by practice, that's right. But if you leave it like this here, it's okay because you, you're able to see. So either way, it's going to be able to go and retrieve it. So here's your definition for your functions, like what we talked about. Okay. So we load X for the month. Um, it's going to, we're going to put, we're going to put the month into register four. So that's going to be the M into register four. We're going to subtract two. And just like the other one, what we want to do is we want to start checking this. So when you subtract one, so basically you have X minus two at that point. Okay. So X minus two is going to get you M. Then we can branch. So if it is negative or zero, we're going to go to get M. Okay. So we, uh, we apply the condition for that. Then we're going to return. So that's going to be for your month function or your subroutine. And then for the get n, we're going to add five. Okay. So I'm mean at 12. So 12 is going to be the 12 months. And otherwise, it's going to be 10 to x, right? So here, we're going to return. Why is that, right? Coming back here. Remember that this start out with mod 12 when we talked about January and February is not part of the current year. But if you're looking at the calendar year, we would do the, the 12. So 12 represents 12 months. Um, but otherwise, it's only going to be the 10 months starting with March until December. January and February follows it falls into the next year if you look at it that way. Okay. So here is where we would then um, back to the calling program we, after we return. Then multiplication in this one, we would use register five and six to save. So we would store register five and register six. Then we're gonna take N and we're gonna load it back into register four. Remember that was what we used up here for X that represent M, so we want to stick with the same. Then we are going to invert it. So now we're going to do the two's complement for M. And next, we're going to have the loop. So when you look at that here, what is that really um, meant, right? So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we set this up. We've got to make sure that we meet this condition and we also implemented this, okay, for the centuries. Now, for the loop, we're going to check to see if M is positive. If it is, it's going to quit. So because R6 is going to be R, um, I'm sorry, R5 and R4, this is your M, right? 
we're going to take the M, we're going to add it with R5, which is where we start with the register class. And we're going to put it onto, we're going to put it on R6. So when it branch zero and positive, we're going to go to quit one. Then your counter is going to be one plus R5. Because this is going to allow us, this loop is used for multiplication. So it's going to multiply by 13 because M times 13. So you need to count it and loop it. So it's going to keep multiplying because multiplying is addition multiple time. So you got to add the counter and then you keep adding until you reach the count value, right? So this is where that loop comes from. So that's going to give us by the end of the loop 13M in register three. And so we would then subtract it with one to give us 13 and minus one. Okay, so that was the parentheses part of the Zeller. Return from that for quit one. Then we are going to load it to register five and six and then return. And so for the save register, you would then just fill it with zero. Okay. Now for the division, because we use it in, in potions, so we would have the new M loaded to register zero. We clear register one. We would add five to register one. So now five is in register one. Then we would check for the new M. If it is zero, we're going to send it to quit two. If it is not, it's going to pick up here. So we're going to initialize or we're going to add zero with register zero to register three and register zero was loaded with new M. So new M is going to be at register three. And then we're going to take the five from register one that we added here and we're going to add it to register four. Okay, then we're going to invert it. So here is where you you divide. So why why do I have a five? Because I have to divide it by five and I gotta loop it to do the division. So I have to subtract five multiple times. And that's what that's what I did there. Right? Looking at this code right here. Okay. So from there, um, you would have divided by five. So you your 13 M minus one, you have to divide it by five. So in the loop two, we're going to set up the counter. We're going to subtract by five. We're going to keep looping. So that way we divide. We're going to branch to zero for quit two. If it is negative, then add the result plus five. If it is uh, negative, then we're going to count down. So these loops, this loop right here, work for the division. Okay. Then for quit two, we're going to return. Then for the division two, we have to set up the century and the year in this one. Okay, similar to the last one, we load D to register zero. We clear register one. We put four into register one. We check to see if D is zero. So because D is in register zero, we add zero to register zero and then it's gonna check there. So if it is zero, we're gonna send it to quit three. We take D, which is in register zero, and we copy it over to register three. So, or we can just add it, right? Add it with a zero to copy. Then we are going to take four, which is in register one, and then we're gonna put it onto register four. We're gonna invert it. So at this point, we are operating the division by four. So when you look at that, right? it will be D divided by four here, okay? So here we divided by four and how we do that is through two subtraction or two's complement. And we're gonna keep, we have to implement a loop for that, right? Because it's gonna keep dividing four times. And so when it reaches the zero, it's gonna go to quit three. And then if it's, it, then we add, if it's negative, we're gonna add the result plus four, and then we are going to update the counter and return. 
So quit three just basically return. So earlier we sent it, if it's zero, we're gonna return, right? If it is not, it's gonna add the, the result with plus four. Then for the division three, which is the, the third part of the equation, which is gonna handle your century and your year. So we load C to register zero again. We are going to clear register one. We add four to register one because we're getting ready to do C divided by four. So then we're going to check to see if C is zero, similar to the last one. We're gonna branch it to zero to quit four. Then we're gonna load the new M to register three. Four from register one into register four. So as you can see, we already added four into a register. We keep reusing it, right? We don't update it. So there, okay. Then we're gonna invert it to represent the division. And then we clear register five. And for the division, just like the last one, we loop. Okay, so you see some repetition in the code in except that, you know, we are using for the second, the next part of your Zeller. And then quit four is gonna be returned. So can you clean this code up a little bit? I would, because there are some repetition in some of the division where it is exactly the same. So you can simply use one subroutine and jump to it again and again, okay? Instead of just like rewriting the code 10 times, okay? And then here's your Zeller. So when we do the Zeller, we're gonna take each of the piece, we're gonna reload it back, because remember, right? And then we add them piece by piece or subtract accordingly, okay? So here you would have, you would take R5, add R5 to represent this, the 2C, just like the, the lab example that I showed you is because R5 is C, so if we double it, we just add itself. And so that, but we need to subtract it. So we would do an invert or two's complement there. And then we would add everything. And then after that, we would have the multiplication where we would add the division and then all together as a sum and return. So here at this point, you would have the F and return. Now to handle the mod seven, you would load the F, okay, to register zero. You would add, or you would clear register one because earlier we had it used for four. So we clear register one, we add seven to register one. And then we would check to see if F is zero. If it is, we're gonna you know, uh, do a return. Right, so you say if, right, F is zero return, right? If it's, then we're gonna branch for negative F, otherwise continue. Then we're gonna take F and put it into register three. We're gonna take seven, which is in register one, put it in register four. And then we are gonna get ready to do the division, which represent the mod. So here is where you do the two's complement and then you clear register five. And for the division, like the last time, when we look at the other parts for the division, you would have to implement the loop to subtract it and count it, okay? So we would have a counter, we subtract seven, and then we branch if it's positive. If it's zero, we would go to return, quit five. And then we would check for the negative result and we would update the counter by subtracting one. Now in the next part, it's gonna do the negative F. So this program is expanded in that it also handled the negative F, right? So it's a little bit better than the other one, but can this program be cleaned up a lot more? Yes, there are a lot of repetition in the code where we should make it a little bit more efficient. Um, so for the negative F, we would bring F into register three, we would invert it, OK? 
okay? And then we take four from register one and copy that onto register four. And then we would do the invert or the subtraction through the, the two's complement, clear register five, okay? Then for the loop, just like the other one for loop six, we would do the division there. And then that will be the end, okay? So you would see section that would be almost exactly the same and it's handled the vision similarly, but with this program, if you piece by piece, what you're doing is you're moving, right? From here to here, to here, to here and here, right? And then include this and combine everything together and then you handle this part. So when I load and run this program, it would give me the same result, but tremendously longer in that it also checked for negative F as well, okay? So I wanna show you this so you can see, but now our time is up, okay? Um, if you like, I can post this. I will add it to the images to the page and I can link it. So if you want to test out this program, you can. And looking at this code is going to help you a little bit on how to work through Zeller equation in the case if you need to implement an equation similar to that in the future for assembly. Okay. All right. Any question? Okay, so let's stop recording.